All right, here we go. Another live stream of Reno. Back from travels. And I've got some video for you. I'm going to answer some questions. And uh, it's going to have a good time today. Hopefully it's coming through. I don't see anything on my end yet. But okay, there we go. We're good. Let me catch up. I had a meeting right before I went live today. So normally I, I source some questions first. And so I hadn't done that. So if you got a great question, go ahead and ask it. The first question, did we get AC installed yet? Yes, it's technically installed, but it's cold out today. So it's actually a little warmer in here. So I still have some of those temperature issues being that, uh, you know, it's a surrounded by roof and it's hot when the sun strikes it is it possible to breed and raise angels with discus i think you could get some eggs to be laid but i think uh raising the fry you'd have to separate them out it uh i don't think you'd raise too many of them and even still the, the parents are gonna have to guard those eggs really well from everything else that's in the aquarium and so most people don't do it out of it's easier uh, to do it separate. But I'm sure there's been some people that have done it and would maybe recommend to do it. But I, I myself would separate the two. And anytime I'm trying to put effort into breeding a fish, I want to make sure I'm setting up myself for success. And the less factors I have to deal with, the better. Sometimes breeding stuff with other stuff actually makes it easier. But a lot of times it'll actually make it harder. So could it be done? I think potentially it could. Would I do it? No, I wouldn't. I think that would lead to uh, a bunch of frustration on my end. What's my best advice for lowering the hardness in your water? Uh, I myself would basically use some live plants and not change water. And so I have hard water. And if I'm looking to make water less hard, by having live plants, they will start consuming some of the hardness minerals out of the water. And if I don't change water, that will gradually go down. And eventually, so let's say you start at 500 parts per million, right? And you want to be at 150 parts per million. It might take you six months to let those plants eat away at it. And you might be going, well, but I've got nitrates and things like that. Hopefully the plants are taking care of all that. Because each time you change water it's gonna raise it up again, right? So if you do a 20% water change and you were at 400 and your tap water is 500, after the water change, you might be like, oh, I'm at 410. I'm going kind of, you know, in the opposite direction. So the longer you can kind of balance that aquarium and hold out and let it get lower, and then you do maybe a 20% water change with 500 parts per million water and yours is at 150, maybe now you're only bumping to that 160, 170 and it's still in the range for the fish you wanna keep. You can definitely go down the road of RODI units and, and buying water and, and things like that, but I don't find those to be sustainable long term, and I prefer um, kind of getting there naturally over time, like natural waterways would. It takes longer, but I enjoy the process more, so that's how I would do it. Okie doke. What color of guppy species do I recommend in planet tanks? Mm, bright colors like I love the black Moscow guppy I think they look great but they don't present as well against green in my opinion as you know a bright red guppy or a bright blue one and so I, I like colors and patterns I think they really stand out and they look good in big numbers but you know I really do love the black Moscow guppy because it's a really beautiful fish it holds its tail and carries it really well and they're, they're fairly easy to line breed. You know, for me, they pretty much always came out true, that nice midnight black color. And when they wouldn't, they would throw an albino. And it was super easy to remove that and uh, keep, keep the line going that I wanted. Oh, I know what's going on. I'm probably hearing myself. Is that, Is that what's going on? No, I think it's these coins. I'm hitting my mouse cord on my... My pile of coins. So, okie doke. Why not a lot of chat about Grindel and white worms? 
I've been through that phase of my life. And uh, usually you can find some some cultures at your local club, maybe even, you know, usually eBay, Aquabid, um, probably Amazon. And you, you, you have them send you this stinky worm culture that you're not even sure is worms. You read about, and we've got articles and videos and stuff on how to do it. You prepare a medium that gets stinky over time and you got to replace it. But then you get all these live worms that are good for feeding your fish. And if you have like, you know, let's say you got a 55 gallon tank with a bunch of different fish and not really just babies, you can put the food in there and they'll gobble it up, but it won't be much, right? It, it's kind of like, you know, having a small garden where, you know, you, you're like, oh, over the whole summer I made a zucchini, right? Where if you're eating zucchini three times a week, like it's not nearly enough. And that's kind of the issue you run to with adult fish is you can make a lot of worms, but they're so tiny. It takes so many to really keep them well fed that it's not really viable. Now, if you're just raising like a clutch of fry, just those babies now, like one little tiny micro or grindle, you know, grindle worm, micro worm, white worm is a meal for that thing. And therefore then it can make a lot of sense. That being said, you got to keep those cultures going. And I always get lazy. You know, I might keep them going for 10 months straight and then I'm going, oh, instead of I was doing it every four weeks on my calendar, well, then it was five and that was fine and that was five and a half and then pretty soon, oh, I got to go out of town. I get back and it's been seven is dead. I'm like, dang it, now I got to order it again. And yes, you can, you can give it another 10. Well, this time I'm going to redo a culture every two weeks. I'll keep three or four cultures going and every two weeks I'll do it. And therefore, even if I get busy, I'll still have a culture to come back to. Really, I find it only works if you have someone close to you and you're both keeping the cultures so that when yours falls down, you can go get some of theirs and it's really easy. Uh, otherwise, I like to use Live Baby Brian because it kind of sits in my freezer and is ready to go 36 hours from the day I need it. Where ramping up, you know, the cultures, when you make a brand new one, they don't necessarily produce a lot. Then, you know, maybe three or four days later, they're producing a ton they do that for about a week and then they start stepping down again. And so they're not always ready at the level you need them. That being said, if you're just getting some fry going, you can uh, kind of get your culture starting to, to go. And that's where that optimization comes in. Like if you start a culture every two weeks, you're more often to have more cultures really bringing those, uh, those worms out for you. So... And outside of that, there's a bunch of ways to optimize, you know, are we using like a sponge method? Are we just, you know, running our finger around the outside? Are we using oatmeal? Are we using mashed potatoes? You know, there's little similarities, but I, I think the first distinction is, is that the thing you want the, um, the, the grind of the worms, you know, the grindle worm grind. <laughs> That's my new, I'm going to make a company or something. Grindle worm grind. If you want to run that treadmill or not. Uh, let's see here. I'm moving from Texas to LA in a couple of months. I'm bring bring the fish on the second day on a two day drive. Sorry, or have a local shop hold and ship them to me once I'm there. That's I, I think there's plenty of disaster scenarios in both. I think what probably makes more sense if you haven't. If you're moving like, uh, let's say I was moving in with my grandma. I know the layout. I could go ahead and set up an aquarium before I get there and that kind of stuff. What I have seen happen a lot for people that move, even just 40 minutes down the road, right? Like next town over. They line up everything. They break down the aquarium. They got all the fish in the buckets. They got the air pumps going. They got like everything's good. And they get to that new place. And then they realize, oh gosh, where did I pack my hose? Or oh gosh, this sink has a different mount. What am I going to do? Or, oh no, the water heater was actually switched off. I don't have any warm water yet. Or I've run out of hot water because I'm moving 10 aquariums. So there's a lot of stuff that can, you know, you're in control of it all, but oops, that kind of fell through the cracks where if you're not moving the fish with you, you get there, you set up all the aquariums, they're all filled with water, they're all cycling, they're all doing their thing, and you pay the money and two weeks later, your fish arrive. There might be a few casualties, hopefully not. 
now they're going into aquariums that are ready to receive them as opposed to taking that journey and you're doing your best. And then when you arrive, it being much more difficult. And then there's the added stress, I think, of it's really stressful to move just your own possessions. And then to add on, the minute we get there, I need to do these set of things. And if you're a pet person like me, you you know, you might have dogs or cats or turtles or, you know, these other things. And so you got, you end up having these really long days, the days you leave and the day you get there. And so when you have these long days and you're more tired and your, your back hurts because you loaded the couch and all the things, you're more prone to make mistakes. And so that's where I, I, I feel like if money is out of the question having your fish shipped to you will be an easier transition for you and those fish on average. But in either scenario, plenty of things could go wrong or go right. And my favorite way of actually moving with aquariums is, and it's, it's definitely a, an expense. So, you know, I, I fully realized a lot of people are like, I can't do that. I totally get it. And I couldn't do that many times also. And I think I've only done it once or twice where I could. And that is, have an overlapping month. So you're paying rent at the old place and you're paying rent at the new place or, or you know, a mortgage or whatever it is, right? You know, just a, a, where you can transition. And I realize it's a two-day drive, right? But in the scope of weekends, let's say you're going to work, you take one weekend and you move all of your possessions. Then you take another weekend and you move your tanks. Or better yet, the first weekend you move all your possessions and half of your fish tanks, knowing that your fish are now all crammed into half your other fish tanks. You get those set up there. You make another trip. You grab the fish and the other half of the fish tanks. You drive straight home. You already got your kitchen set up. You've already got the couch. You've already got the bedroom done. All you got to do is focus on getting the fish into the tanks that are already set up. All right, so buckets of fish in. The filters are running. And then you've got four more aquariums sitting that you can set up next weekend and then as they get set up and they're running good you start moving the fish again so there's that option uh that has worked well for me especially when i have to move whole fish rooms like i i don't have a store where i could just be like hold all of these fish which would be like our it's more than our entire quarantine room and so i had to well i didn't have to do that i chose to do it that way and then also i'm an advocate for rehoming when you're moving, it's the perfect time to go, am I actually still enjoying this fish? If not, if I'm on the fence, I I bring it to my store and let them sell it. And then I, I did that way before I owned a store because I realized that I'm already got to catch them anyway. This is the perfect time. I may as well catch them and then I'll, I'll give them to the store. They'll find good homes. And when I get to my new place, I'll have less bio load and I'll have more room if I want to get different fish. And so I just was killing multiple birds with one stone. Hold on, I gotta have some broth here. My voice is already. That's right, still testing the Aquarium Co op uh, camping mug, which I just use in my house. But we actually just ran a new design on these, so we, they might actually come to fruition. A few weeks ago, you asked me to email customer service about a Teespring hoodie, and I'm happy to report the co-op sent me a new hoodie and coins. There you go. We will do our best within reason, which our, our within reason threshold is pretty high, to uh, make a customer happy. That's our, you know, it's basically, where was I? Oh, yeah, I was, I was reading about YouTube, and, and I agree with the, uh, with the mentality of, like, focus on the audience, not on the algorithm. And for us in, in business, it's like focus on making the customer happy and then they'll spend money. And so instead of going, how can we get them to spend more money? It's kind of like, well, how do we make them happier? And how do we make sure they have a good time? And then they will just spend more money over time. Welcome Dakota Schneider, your first live stream as a member. When will I be making a video of my trip to China? They are with the editor currently. Um, we're kind of ahead in videos, so they will be coming out. I'm guessing you know sometime in the next month ish, 
and uh i think we're making like five or six videos but we might um stagger them right so if you watch six weeks in a row of, of china videos you might be like ah that's too much but if we stagger them out over a few months you might go oh yeah that's right that, that was another cool thing from that trip but don't worry i won't make you wait too much longer i've got a little uh what do i want to call it a little not a slideshow but some stuff to show from china i thought it was cool that uh we were visiting some of the factories and they would allow me to film certain parts. And so I grabbed some vertical video, which has actually worked out really well for this format, I think. And I want to show you some pictures and some video of how some of these things are made. And, uh, you know, and, and I, I, I probably, I, I probably don't need to specify this, but I will like, I didn't go out of my way to like doctor these or not show anything. I just asked, could I show this machine? And then I did. And so when you see, and there's like, there's no employees, like that's because this thing's fully automated, right? All right. So the first thing is I took a picture of this because you guys hear me. Hopefully you'll see a picture on the screen. I'll see it over here in a second. But you guys hear me often say we have to open new molds. And so is the aquarium co-op molds for different things. And we just paid to open up like six more molds because we're doing some really cool things. Um, and so these big metal things that they'll force plastic into and make things happen are what the big money costs. And so it, it wouldn't look like it, but, you know, molds are anywhere from three to $10,000 each, depending on how complicated those molds are. So, and then I, I thought, let's, uh, you know, let's, let's show some of the process. So we're, this picture is actually from where our sponge filters are made. So there's probably like three people that will ever watch. It's like, I know that factory. Like, that's pretty neat. So then from there, uh, let's see, what do I want to, I want to make, yeah, let's these, we'll turn this one on. So this video will loop and we can watch it a little bit. This video you're going to see, it is a, a, what's called a plastic injection molding machine. So you take those, those molds that we have and you basically get, you know, you heat up plastic and you, you pump it in, and then you let it set, and then you'll have your parts that get kicked out. And so this, what I'm going to show you, this first one is, they weren't making our sponge filter with this one. They were, they had the machine set up to make, um, you know, the the dual sponge filters that uh, have the suction cups, you stick to the back glass, and they got the real fine foam. They were making the internal parts where you'd put the sponge over. And so that process looks like this. So here I am looking at the machine and just kind of watching how it works. And down below, you can see the parts and you're gonna watch them come down, they just slide out. And that machine can run 24 hours a day and it's, it's looping again so you can see it again. But 24 hours a day, they could just make, I don't know how many they can make per day. I didn't ask like, could you make 10,000? You make, you know, a thousand, whatever it is. But they basically have this giant box of uh, plastic and the plastic is this clear plastic beads and then there's very few uh, black color dyed beads and so to get that black color it takes like one little black bead for every 500 clear beads you would think that it would be like oh they're all black plastic beads like no it's very little bit of black turns it all black kind of interesting right so they inject the plastic in there and that's what's going on. And then this this little tool at the top that I kind of focused on, I'm going to show you uh, that a little later. But that actually, it makes it, there's a grid, right? So it makes them out. It's got to punch them out. Kind of like if you've ever put a model together, right? If you've ever done a model where you built an airplane or something, you you punch out the plastic parts or, you know, maybe you're used to doing Warhammer figures. You, you punch out the parts and you're left with the ring or, you know, the part that it was molded on. Well, this machine actually reuses those uh, in real time. So I'll show you that next, actually. And so that'll be this one right here. Uh, hit the button right. Okay, so this different angle. I'm on the other side of the machine this time. And the top arm is going to grab that extra piece out of there. And so there it grabbed it. It's going to dump it into this little bin. There it goes. It gets ground up vacuumed up to the top 
and whirlwinded around to be put back in for the next round of injecting. So there's, you know, because let's say 30% of that plastic went to make the, the thing to be able to handle it and punch it out. We don't want to waste 30% of the plastic. And so in this way, it seemed to me basically very little waste because that would go right back into the system, be ground up and heated up quickly and put it in the next one. And you can see there on the bag, they're actually using ABS plastic. That's what we make a lot of our plumbing parts from, like as in for our homes. All right. So yeah, that, that was cool to see that how that process worked. And then this, this machine, these were all operating at the exact same time, by the way. So they had like four or five machines going, cranking out just different parts of that day. I'm sure there is someone, it's their job to set up the, the mold and go, hey, this runs for five hours, that runs overnight, this runs for two days, whatever that is. Uh, and this one, this one we're going to see here is actually making bio balls. And so by the way they were making their bio balls, you can see they just fall into there. Uh, they are two pieces and they get put together. So they're making halves. And so that thing injects the plastic. You'll watch it kind of move and then it'll punch them out and they come out the bottom. And so it's, you know, making thousands and thousands of one half of the bio balls every day or hour. And you can see in that video, it punches them out from the back, right? So if you, if you look at, can I, can I pause the video? Is that a thing I can do? I don't know if I can, but it, you know, the mold is like this, it gets pushed together, injected, comes out, and then it pushes them through. And then that other piece gets taken from the top and recycled back into the next one that it'll do. <coughs> so I thought that was pretty cool. I don't know why it just, Sometimes seeing things made that you've seen a million times, you're like, oh, I guess I didn't really know how that was made. And then another part of the factory, there's some assembly that goes on, right? Because right now we're just making parts. Well, eventually they got to get assembled. And uh, so that's where they're, this is not our exact sponge filter bottom, but this is, you know, these are ones that are just black. And you can see here, they've got this big piston machine and basically, uh, what's right off camera there is is they're putting in the, the metal ring or the, the weight goes into the bottom of it. There's a cap, and uh, the cap gets compressed on there, so it's a real tight fit. And then this little suction cup thing at the end lifts it out and drops it in the bucket. And then someone, I think what we saw, because I didn't see anyone actually putting sponge filters together, but I believe that to be a manual process. Someone just snaps a couple rings like we would with a cleaning one and into a box it goes. So, um, yeah, that was kind of the, the process of, of uh, making some sponge filter parts. I just thought that was neat. So, you know, that's kind of what we were doing while we're in China is we're there to, to see how's our stuff being made, understand the process more, maybe be able to make... Uh, adjustments like oh now that i understand how it's made no wonder you can't make this thing do the thing i want it to do um and so yeah it was just it was interesting to see a lot of what was being done all right so what else do we do in china we we went to the fish markets we went to other manufacturers and found i think i think our official tally was there's 15 potential products. So what, what does that mean? That means that, uh, you know, we like the concept. We need to make changes. We want to see what pricing is. We want to see, can they meet demand? Does it perform the way it did at the show or the showroom versus in our aquariums? Make sure no trickery is going on. And then what happens over time is, let's say nine of those make the cut. And then over the next two years, basically, those nine things will roll out and uh, you know, we got to make packaging. We got to make our changes. Some maybe they're good to go right off the bat and some may need a lot of R and D right um, where that, that one you saw there, they also had 3d printing capabilities. And so we were making modifications on the fly that we want to do with sponge filter. So that hopefully will will launch this year. I'm hoping, but we'll have to wait and see if, uh, if, like samples might be on the way. Well, I don't know. We, we paid to open the molds. So then I don't know how long the molds are going to take to be made, but, uh, 
once they're made, they'll send us test parts. We'll test them. If they fit just like we want, then we'll put it to full production. Okie dokie. Yeah, I'm loving the explanation of how it's made. I, I enjoy it too, because there's... I, I guess I just didn't know how things were um, made. Like, you, 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 see, you know, you, like you talk about molds, injection molding versus... Like, one of the parts for our new sponge filter design is going to be laser welded. I didn't see the laser welding machine, so I can... In my mind, I'm like, I mean, yeah, it's like a 007 movie, right? That laser's going to cut something in half, except this time it's going to bond the plastic. But then you might get there and you might see it next time we visit and you're like, oh, that thing? That little, that little, you know, like, looks like a laser, like you're checking stuff out at the checkout or something. You know, you never know until you see it. So I, I do think it is beneficial for us to um, see the process so that when we're going to make a change or something, we can kind of envision what would that take to pull off? What machinery would you use? Oh, that, that'd be labor intensive or it wouldn't. Um, yeah. Did I ever find the metallic yellow platy I'm looking for? I haven't. I'm looking for, it's more of an orange than a yellow, but uh, no, I haven't seen that same strain that I've been hunting for for so long. What else did we do in China? Um, mostly just visited, yeah. We, we Oh, visited a couple fish farms. I caught COVID while I was there. Kind of a mild version. Um, yeah, that's, it was, it was a lesser attendant attended uh show this time too so because they're doing it they're still doing one in november also which we're not going to go to that one but they're doing two in one year which seems like not a good idea but what do i know the hottest day it was like a hundred and with well with the humidity it was the feels like temperature on the hottest day was 111 and then we'd go into uh like the fish farms the indoor parts were way warmer than 111 What was the best meal I had in China? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of proper in China because we had some good meals in Hong Kong as well, but it was kind of a strikeout on food a lot of this time we were there. Uh, I think the best, the thing I most memorable that I ate was, uh, what, what do they call them? They call them chicken onion rings. Like, we went to this place where, I, well, I've learned, okay, I've learned. If you just say, oh, whatever will be fine for lunch, I remember one fish farm took us to their favorite spot, and it was raw eel, raw bamboo shoots, and something else. And it just was not, it wasn't bad, it just wasn't great, it's like, oh, it's, I mean, this is food, but, you know, I really would have just eaten some Mexican or something, right? Or, like, not Mexican, but just, like, some food I'm more accustomed to. So now we, we try to say, you know, when they ask, like, well, what do you want? We don't want to cost them a ton of money and be like, we want to go somewhere fancy. We're trying to, usually we're trying to hit multiple places and keep it quick and easy. And so they'll throw some things out and normally we'll just say, ah, you know, just some American food will be fine because that's easy, right? And so they they had this thing on the menu that was uh, chicken onion rings and it, by golly, was chicken onion rings. So, uh they were interesting. They were good and interesting. Like, I don't know that I'd order them all the time, but definitely memorable where, um, what else did I have there? One day we, we had some, some pizza hut, which pizza hut there is more of like an Italian place. Kind of, they serve a lot of pasta and stuff too, but I had tuna fish pizza. And then what else? We did like the hotel buffet where there's unlimited seafood and that kind of stuff. And we did McDonald's once or twi twice, I think. And then, you know, there's lots of those local spots where you're like, here, yeah, here. Because food is is kind of the, the the after effect of like, yeah, we're working a lot. We just need to get food. And, and mostly it's it's lots of waters and drink in. Like we need water. We need to buy waters. You need to use the restroom. We need to drive to the next thing. And so we were spending a lot of time in the car. So they'd send a driver and like go to that factory. It's like, oh, it's 95 minutes there and back. And then if you got traffic, oh, it's longer. So you'd be trying to hydrate a bunch and, uh, you know, just get a small meal in. And and also our, our sleep schedules were all screwed up. So it was, uh, 
you weren't hungry that often. And so we ate a lot at the the hotel. They have a business lounge we paid for, and they always have like little sandwiches. So you'd, you'd get three or four of those and a and a cold water or two and hang out. All right. What do you think about small plecos in a shrimp breeding tank, mainly a shrimp tank? In my opinion, as long as the plecos aren't breeding, it works out pretty well. I've, I've definitely done it. And they, what I, what I noticed was when the pleco population would boom and I'd have hundreds of plecos in like a 29 or a 20 gallon, the shrimp wouldn't make as many. They wouldn't die off. They just wouldn't make as many where when I only had one or two plecos, I'd be like, wow, we're making tons and tons and tons of shrimp. And so if I caught a bunch of plecos and t like sold them to a store before I own my own store, I'd see the the real boom of the uh, of the shrimp population. So just know that certain bio loads and food and everything you're gonna put in, like it's a give and take thing. Like you can make more of these, you'll make less of that. You make more of these, you'll make less of that. Okie dokie. What kind of sauce was on the the tuna fish pizza? It was like mayonnaise basically so if you think about it you're like wait so bread mayonnaise cheese and tuna fish you're like it's kind of a sandwich yeah it kind of is um but there was a lot of a lot of as i call it point and shoot like uh i'm gonna go with this one because there was like durian pizza which if you've never smelled durian whoa uh in fact a lot you know there's some hotels that won't even allow you to eat durian in the hotel so like if you'd bought that pizza and brought it back to your hotel you wouldn't be able to because it's so got such a distinct smell uh but they're like i remember randy it spent like five minutes trying to explain like we want pepperoni on this and they just like you what because they had it on a different pizza but it was like totally totally different they're like you just want pepperoni you are crazy so um yeah it, it was always there's always a layer of uh of difficulty but enjoyable because sometimes you know like randy fell in love with the uh the mcdonald's chicken it was super duper greasy i, never, I didn't even try it because i'm not big on the fried chicken but you know he, he was always like yeah more fried chicken A customer took me out for authentic Chinese, ordered seven different things in Mandarin. It's very different from American Pan-Asian. I loved it. It is very different. And some of it is crazy, crazy good tasty. You know, that's like how I found I, I enjoyed uh, chicken cartilage when I was in Japan. Like, I'll try about anything. But there is a level of, it's been a long day. I've been working hard. I hope one of the things on the table, I'll be like, ooh, this is nice to eat. And not like... Oh, this is it. You know, it's food, but it's not great for me. The other side of smugs enjoy nature daily, by the way. Do I think clown killies are compatible with a pisto borelli? Hmm. You've got some clown killies in quarantine. I'm afraid to move them because they're small. I think that's a legitimate concern. Maybe adults, maybe they're okay, but smaller, like maybe they're snacks. I, I'm always of the, if you have multiple aquariums, split them up, breed those clown killies, which is not too difficult. You just need some floating plants. Uh, once you've made some, then try going, hey, are these compatible together? Because I don't feel as bad when, you know, like, okay, I bought six of these. Now I have 60. I'm going to move six of them with the Borelli and a week later, like, oh, I only got five and a week later, oh, I only got four. And then you move the four out. But if you, you know, got six and two weeks later, you still have six and a month later, you got six and maybe you move another six. So I, that way I don't, I don't experience the monetary loss. And I feel like, well, in the realm of lives, I'm still plus, you know, 48 that I've made and brought into the world compared, you know, even though those ones got eaten by another fish. And, uh, yeah. Have I ever kept killifish outside? I've had more success breeding my gardener eye than I expected. Uh, yeah. It's, 
I have, and it might have even been Gardner Eye, I think it was. And I think it's because I do so well eating bugs. Like, Achilles are just ready to eat bugs, and bugs fall into water all the time. And so, but yes, usually you're putting them into a bigger type tote compared to an aquarium. Like, even a small pond is a big aquarium, kind of. And I think with the, the organic matter that falls in, I think with the plants that start growing, the green water and the bugs, it's a perfect scenario for those Achilles to make a ton of them. And then you do kind of run into a problem of like, Achilles aren't the best, um, you know, aren't the best sellers at a store. And so it's not always easy to uh, unload 70 Gardner Achilles at your local store. So you usually got to unload them cheap. Can you grind up extreme krill flake in your fingers fine enough for newly birthed guppy fry? Yeah, definitely. Guppies, on the scale of how small their food needs to be, doesn't need to be that small. So that, you know, flake food in general is great for all live bearers, and grinding it up works really well. So, um, yeah, I'd say you wouldn't have a problem. I, I even think for brand new guppies, the Extreme Nano works also. Or as Ray says, just buy the fry food from Corey. That's true. We do have our own aquarium co-op fry food. Um, I use it all. Like, it's it's... I don't know. I, I think a lot of people, myself included, sometimes you get caught up in the hype with how good of quality the food is. But the reality is, I think it's much more important how often and how much instead of how good. That wasn't always the case, but foods have gotten so good across the board that it's not so much am I feeding something good or bad. It's a little bit better for more money versus a little bit worse. And there's always going to be some, you know, some outliers there of like, you know, Wardley koi pellets are, are dang near recycled cardboard. I mean, they're, they're not, but I'm just saying like the ingredient wise, you're just like, what is the first ingredient here? Air? Like what is in these things? Like, it seems like nothing. I miss good Mandarin dishes. Yeah, there's, there's, the the thing I don't like about traditional Chinese food is some, you know, things will be labeled spicy and sometimes you get it and you're like, not spicy at all. And then other times you take a bite and you, you realize you've entered, you know, level flow, le level seven of, of uh fiery inferno level and you're, you're going to die. And so, and I, I'm sure it's a language barrier if you're like, oh, that thing's got a spicy pepper next to it. Eh. you know, and sometimes you eat and you're like, oh, it's not that spicy. And then other times you eat and you're like, oh my gosh, what is this? This is brutal. And so I try to avoid the spicy stuff after the one time where I, you know, they were threatening to call an ambulance because it was so bad and I was sneezing and crying and nose was running and, you know, they thought, thought I was going to pass out. Can I suggest another Tetra that will pop? In a tank with canned canes. Uh, if they're all kind of that bigger body Tetra, I might try, or at least I want to try, uh, Diamond Tetras. The other ones that I, I, I would do is Congo Tetras if the tank's big enough. But Diamond Tetras, they're a little, they're kind of like a tiger barb in terms of personality. But boy, do they look good when they're growing up and, and moving around. I can bring you Chinese food in Singapore next time. Yeah, that, you know, one of the biggest things is just having somebody with you that speaks a language and be like, hey, I've been with you a few days. You're not going to like that or you should try this. You're going to love it. And because uh, bo both Randy and I, we're adventurous eaters. We'll try near anything. But if you, you know, like anything, if you hit three meals in a row, you're like, oof, that was rough. That was a little rough. You kind of want to come back to some kind of comfort food of like. Yeah, this pizza, like it's real hard to do pizza wrong, right? Or I'm trying to think, or sushi. We had sushi one night. I'm trying to think. I didn't because I'm, I'll eat sushi, but I don't appreciate it at the price it's at. So, you know, I would much rather have like chicken or, or fish katsu curry or something. What did I have at that place? I ended up having different chicken dishes. Some chicken fried rice they had, some desserts. Um, 
What else was on the table? Yeah, all kinds of stuff. I support you by buying my or your products at my local store, Tropical World Pets in St. Louis, Missouri. Awesome, Mark. That is, I think that's my favorite because I know that by you buying from them supports your local store. So it's almost, you know, I, I probably shouldn't say it because it costs my company money, but I feel like I like it more when it's like, hey, a local store is doing well and we get to do well. That's a win-win as opposed to if you just buy from us, we make more money, but I don't get the double win. So, did I give out any coins during my trip? Mm. Yeah, I gave out one, actually. Um, well, one at the airport on the way home uh, to Tyler, which I think I might have even seen him in the chat today. Uh, and then the other one I gave, so I, I gave away a couple of my business cards. So I have a coin that's my business card with my email and, uh, you know, president title and all of that. And a couple people got those um that i actually needed to contact get in contact with myself but then we were with a vendor and uh we eventually go out to lunch so we've been with them for like two or three hours right and we parked the car at the mall and this is where we were gonna have the chicken uh, onion rings right so we parked the car at the mall and we're waiting to go up this elevator because you know we're in a car park way down low and so we're standing there, and all of a sudden she goes, Oh my God, you're the guy from YouTube. Literally, like this company that we've been doing business with had no idea that we were on YouTube. And what she had she had told us after the fact was, We have watched your videos and things like that to try and write descriptions for other people's products around the world. And I kind of found that hilarious. But it took hours before she realized, oh, my gosh, this is Corey from Aquarium Co-op. And then it was, oh, you're famous and blah, blah. So as we were sitting down uh, and eating lunch, that's when I gave her the wildcat coin. I was like, here's the wildcat coin. You know, you kind of got to meet me out of my element and stuff like that. And, and she appreciated it. And, uh, yeah, so I think I just gave out. Was it just the one? Or was there? I'm trying to remember. I might have given away another coin. Uh, yeah, I believe I did another coin to, I can't remember the business name. I have the business card, but they're selling Chinese fish natives in America. I think they're based out of Maine and they're importing. So like a lot of the, uh, a lot of the stiffen and gobies or goby types and bitterlings and a few other things. So it's hard when you're, you're somewhere for like 10 days and your, your schedule's wicked. I think it was it was those two, I think. Uh-oh, top tip. While traveling and successfully eating food that might be spicy, order cucumber or melon to neutralize the acid in the chili. Okay. I was not aware of that tip. Yeah, I like that. I try to not do spicy, but sometimes... You know, you're just like, everything's kind of labeled as spice. Like, how spicy are we talking? And so I try to avoid it because that's, that's a layer of complication I don't want. Do I have a subject when you come to... Wait. I feel like I'm getting, I'm getting roped into something here. Aquarian co -op. Do you have a subject when you come in September to the Coast Fish Club in California? This would be news to me. I myself don't know that I'm coming to the Coast Fish Club in California. So if that's a true thing and that's on the internet somewhere, let me Google that. That Because that happens more than you would think. You would think like sometimes people put stuff out there and it's like, I never agree to this. Uh, the Coast Fish Club, California, Aquarium Co-op. Hmm... I'm not seeing anything yet, but if, yeah, Coast Fish Club, okay, here's our Facebook, see if there's like an announcement that I'm coming, I see Joe, or Ron Coleman, Gary Lang, uh, I just don't want to disappoint people on accident and be like, oh, who okayed this and didn't tell me, so I don't have a topic because I'm, I'm unaware that, that I'm attending 
And I'm not I'm also not saying that I am attending, but yeah, I don't see anything about it. So I don't have a topic lined up. How can I make more guppies? Wait, how can I make my guppies more hardy without overwintering? Because my winters get negative 30 Celsius. Uh, I want a super hardy, gu hardy guppy, and I don't care much about color. I would probably move this experiment into a garage, and I would be doing it with a heater. And so I'd, I'd heat them, and maybe each uh, three months, well, let's see, what would I do? I would probably do every four months, I would turn the temperature down by a degree. And so the theory being, if it takes about 30 months, or 30, 30 days of gestation for these guppies to have new babies, that they're about three months old, and they go down a degree, and then they'll have babies, right? And then they'll go down a degree, and then they'll have babies, and then they'll go down a degree. And so over time, you're going to start, and if you start seeing... Uh oh, we're really the the colony starting to starting to struggle. Don't keep turning it down. Maybe you give them like a year at that, and then you go, okay, now we're gonna turn it down one more degree. And there, there's gonna be a threshold, right? Like you're not gonna be able to go down to just nothing, but you might go, hey, look at these. They were being kept at 28 Celsius, and now I'm keeping them at 18 Celsius over years. So I I would do that, and then you can also um, have like another tank with last year's, uh, not last year's, but last batches. So that way, if you went too cold and it was too adverse, then you go back. Um, can you use a five whisper? Wait, can you use five whisper 40 air pumps and hook them up and work? on a DIY PVC pipe outlet hookup and run several tanks, will they work or will they cancel out air? And yes, Scotty, I saw that your girl, you can never get a question answered. Don't worry, everybody can get their question answered if I see it. Uh, so those are diaphragm air pumps. You can kind of get that to work. What's gonna happen long-term as the diaphragms wear, right, not all of them will have equal output pressure. And when they stop having equal output pressure, some of the air will want to push back against the ones trying to pump out. So in general, the, the, the common wisdom is a linear air piston pump, which is, think of like a piston in a car. It's a you know piece of metal moving back and forth that compresses air. So metal pieces that don't have the wear of rubber. Those you can run in series and they will add to each other. Whereas diaphragm pumps, which is a rubber piece, which I wish. Uh, can I? Maybe I'll. Okay. Now I'm doing it. I can take my own air pump apart, I think, and show a diaphragm. Wait, we're going to be at the mercy. Does this fit? If this fits, we can do it. If it, if it doesn't. Nope, I need, I gotta get a longer screwdriver, I don't have it. So I'm not that worried, AKA Katie don't run up here with a small screwdriver, my wife, cause she would do that. But the piece of rubber that vibrates with a magnet back and forth as it wears, and you can modify that by bending. Don't do it to ours cause you'll ruin the, we always get people that like go too far and like I snapped this thing off cause Corey said you could bend this thing. And it's like, well, if you know what you're doing, you know, you could, you could do that. but. You, if you bend the piece of metal or you make a change, that will change the amount of pressure. Could be worse, could be better. So I myself would say, instead of trying to bond five 40, Whisper 40s together, resell them or save up and buy an air pump that's meant to run those few tanks is what I would do long term. Because even if it works today, maybe... Four and a half months from now, uh-oh, this tank's not getting air because one of the pumps is starting to wear too much. All right. So, Corey, being a fish guy, are you team orcas attacking yachts? 
I I don't know. I feel like I feel like I don't know enough about that story to weigh in on it. Because it feels like, oh, this is a joking thing where, you know, like when whales jump and they like nearly capsize a boat and that's a crazy. Or it's something where it's like, oh man, I didn't know and I I shouldn't comment on that. So that's where I'm at with that. Because too often I, I give an opinion and then I'm like, oh, I was, I did, that's not what I was talking about at all. Okay, well, I just look dumb now. Don't take it apart, you'll void the warranty? Yeah, it's, I can't, I shouldn't even say that. We'll do our best to take care of it even in those situations. But definitely when you're like, I did all these mods, we're more likely to be like, yeah, that's on you. That isn't on us. Uh, by the way, let me look that up. By the way, I never said in a live stream because I've, I've been gone for too long and vacation and COVID and all of these things. If you remember, you got the one notification. We have the Oliver Knott books. And if you have received that book and you're enjoying it, drop a comment right now. But there appears to be 102 left between our physical retail store and online. We started with 400-ish, and we went through over half of them in the first 24 hours of the members. So good job buying them. Uh, but it's a it's a cool book that I thought, and the money goes to supporting Oliver Not, which is good in my opinion. It's a nice read for, you know, maybe a couple days or just one night. And it's mostly about, like, I feel like you'll know more about Oliver Knott, Takashi Amano, and the old days of aquascaping. And not so much like, this is how I'm going to make my aquascape look better. But if you're a fish nerd, I feel like it's a collector's item and a good story to just absorb you know it, it's kind of like the best way i could probably put it is it's like you watch you go in and you watch a movie that you didn't think you're gonna like and you come out on the other side going actually that was really good i normally don't watch this type of movie and that's how i feel this book is like normally i'm reading something how to breed or something super technical and this was not super technical and was oliver's account of working with takashi amano uh his aspirations on how long it took him to even go because, you know, and him being recognized for having some aquascaping skills and stuff. And hindsight being twenty twenty, right? Like, he's a world-renowned aquascaper for many years now. But at the time and the coming up of talking about your story of like, oh, it would be so crazy if I ever got to do any of this stuff. And now he's done so much. And so, but it, it's I think it's very fascinating to read from that perspective of you're getting the snapshots of like in the moment trying to make your way in the world. And so I just, I think it's a really cool book. It won't be reprinted. There's, they're all signed and there's only, well, I, I guess I don't know how many are in America, but to the best of our knowledge, there's only, we're the only ones he's imported with. So maybe some, a few more have, have got over the pond, if you will. But uh, definitely we got the lion's share and, and ours are signed. So it's a $70 book, so it's not cheap. And we, we please ask you, don't buy a bunch. We don't want to see people, uh, you know, reselling them for a ton of money. That's not, that happens a lot with aquatic books and not, it goes against the, uh, it goes against the, the reason most people are making a book. There are books that are made just to like farm money, but a lot of these books, especially like this, where they're really trying to pass on kind of information and a story it's not to make a ton of money. Like, we're not making a ton of money. The print quality is super good. It was crazy expensive to import them across the world. And then we're packing them super good, so it costs a billion dollars to ship. But, uh, you know, I, I, I do think some... I enjoyed it. I read it while I was on vacation in Hawaii, cover to cover in one sitting. And I'm not a guy that usually does that. Usually I can go, oh, great, I've read four or five chapters. Let me put that down. I'll come back to that. Where I was like, wow, this is great. And, you know, in an afternoon, there I was. I had learned the history of that part of Oliver's life. And that's when I said, I got to sell this. This is great. I really enjoyed this. And and I, I live my life that way, my business that way. If I really enjoy something, I want to tell others about it. And hopefully they will enjoy it too.
what are my tips for someone who wants to start a fish store? I probably need to do like a course or something at this point, but I would say watch a lot of the videos from when I was working in my store. You'll see day-to-day -day struggles. You'll see how I grew or how I didn't grow, challenges. Uh, but the, the biggest the biggest and most important thing that I will always tell people, and people will uh, combat me or say I'm wrong on this, and that's fine. Everyone's got a different way to do things. This is just my way. I would strongly urge you to go run someone else's fish store. That's what I did. And that's what I've seen work out for other people in the industry. And so what that means is, yeah, you go get hired on by a pet store and work your way up. Like, okay, now you're middle management. Now you're doing all the ordering. You're, you're, you know, and even if it's not just a dedicated fish store, at least become like the department manager of the aquatics thing. So, you know, the vendors on first name basis, both dry goods and wet. And so that way, when you strike out on your own, you know, where do you order neon tetras? You don't order from the same place you get rummy nose tetras. You don't order those from the same place you're buying plecos and apistos. Dry goods, you know, the discount over here is this and it's that over there. You know, these guys are out of stock all the time. You know, this is this. You know, all of those things. So that when you've got your limited cash pool, the odds are the best of you surviving. Because it's a tough road. And if you can learn all of that before... You need to learn all the things you don't know you need to know yet. Like, people think all the time they'll work in a store. You, you, you could come work in my store for five years, and I promise you, the day you go start your own, you're going to be like, well, I, 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 I didn't realize how expensive it was to pull a permit to get a sign on my building. I didn't realize all of these things that you will have never had to do because you only had to do it once, the permitting process for a sign. Or the permitting process for an auto water change system. Or buying insurances. Or all of these things that seemingly like they just exist. But they're one time things. And are very time consuming to navigate. So. Uh, your light is perfect in color. If you're doing houseplants. They are the same color. And they grow great. Also I use houseplant lights for aquariums. And they are the best. Light is light really. Pick a color you like, pick a price point you like, pick features you like, pick a warranty you like. And if the plants respond well and you respond well, well, sounds like you're doing pretty good. I lose the uplift tubes for my aquarium co-op sponge filters. I don't know why. A source of replacements, info on the size of tubes so I can hunt for replacements. I don't have the millimeter size off the top of my head. I'll say this, if you can wait, we will, uh, we did, we fully intend to launch a product that will allow you to get more uplift tubes. Yeah, that's, that's the best way I could put it. We don't have it yet. So don't hammer customer service because we don't have it yet. That's part of the molding process. We're working on a thing and will that roll out in four weeks, four months, four years? My answer to that is always when the testing checks out, that's when it rolls out. And, uh, you know, I don't let money lead us. I let, do I think this is a good product? In fact, I've got a product I was testing, what is today, Wednesday, Monday. Even though I've been working on this thing, I, I think I'm in like year four. I took a video and I told Randy, I go, look, I, I don't think we launched this product. I don't think, I think too many people when they get it, will have think this thing should be better. So we sent it back again to the manufacturer and go, we need this, we need to change it again. And we will do that. And some products never make it, you know, but I, I guess what I'm trying to stress to you guys is whether a product does well or not doesn't really matter. I mean, it matters that we stay in business, but I will have vetted it to the best of my ability. Now, things can change, manufacturing process could change, I can be wrong, but I won't put my seal on it until I feel like this is the way the company should go. I believe in this product, I stand behind this product. Not every product is meant for every person, but if someone has a need, and I think this product fits that need, and I test it, and I really like it, I will sell it. 
So just like not everybody needs that book. I get it. Not everyone needs a book. I happen to be in a spot where I wanted to enjoy a book and it, it, it did that for me. So I'm $10 and one cent away from free shipping. What should I buy? This is kind of my favorite game because I've been doing this lately with my own store. I go, what is it I need? Because I, I don't buy anything because I'm like, I own 10,000 of everything. But then I'm at home in the fish room and I'm like trying to do something I'm like, wait, dang it. Why didn't I grab this while I was there? Um, so what would I buy? What, what would Corey buy? I feel like I would just buy more freeze-dried foods. I've been feeding them like a madman. I just, the quality, I don't know, I think it's really good, and they float, and I get to see my fish. Maybe you've already loaded up on that, so, okay, maybe not freeze-dried foods, but buy more freeze-dried foods. I think they're dope. What would, ooh, hmm, hmm, what are the things I use daily? Let, let me, let me tell you what I need for my fish room. How about that? A guy that owns it all. What do I need more of in my fish room? I want more of the black towels because I always use them and set them down and they're wet and they get stinky and then Katie will wash them. But we were on this yesterday. She's like, should I wash them? I'm like, don't wash them all. I'm going to be out here tomorrow. My arms will be wet and I'll need to like wipe my arm down and be like, where's a towel? I said, you can take all of them but one. So I needed some more. I need some more of those. And then... uh I also myself need more of the specimen containers. I use them to water my plants, like my house plants. I've got two of them occupied by all my turtle eggs. I've got one of them in a weird way where I'm using it with an auto feeder. And I actually don't have one free at the moment to catch fish. Oddly enough, I'm using them for all these other purposes except for catching fish at the moment. So I need another one. That's what, so I, freeze-dried foods, towels, and... Uh, the specimen container are what are on my shopping list. Uh, let's see here. Ah, Katie also added another thing. We've lost our pair of tweezers. Katie doesn't like to touch seafood. She doesn't like the smell. So when she's feeding Ladybird, she prefers to remove them from the freezer into a cup with tweezers. And she's like, where's the tweezers? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know where tweezers are. But I'm sure they're you know, next to a tank or something, but I'm not going to spend an hour trying to find them when I could just have two pairs and then not have that problem. I run a big magnet on my free fridge so that my scissors, my thermometer, and my tweezers are normally magnetized right to there, but they're not there. If they're not there, I don't know where they are. All right. Your website says it takes, wait, your website says it takes shipping longer for aquarium co-op backup air pumps. Can you generally say how long it takes to ship Versus the two to three day regular shipping timelines. Well, it'll depend on where we're shipping it to. So like if you're in Washington, it's still wicked quick. But if you're in Florida, the furthest away you could be, not as quick, right? And basically, um, the air pumps, because they have the battery in them, because they have the battery, they're not supposed to go on planes. And so they ship via the ground. Now, we have had air pumps arrive just as fast in that two to three days, even really far away because that truck was beelining it to there. But then, depending on mail, right, sometimes there's not as much stuff going to that place. They don't have a full truck. And so that truck's got to make a stop here, pick up mail, drop off mail there, do this, do that. Now it takes six days. Um, so the, we're actually waiting. So right now it used to say... Uh, it used to say when things would ship out and everything, but, or when it might arrive. And now we're like, you know, with the air pumps, that's not always true. So we removed that part and we're waiting to re-implement the part where uh, it'll at least let you know how fast we'll ship it. Because like right now it's 5 p.m. here, but uh, basically up until about 2.30, 3 p.m. in the West Coast or on the West Coast, we will ship same day. And so that, that right there almost deletes a day of travel time. Most companies from my, my research of ordering from companies and documenting our competitors and, you know, like Hoka shoes and clothing and all, I, I, we, we document all the time because we just want to see what every industry is doing. And, um, 
we find that some of the big companies like Nike and Target and stuff, they're waiting five to seven days before they even put it on a truck. And so our big thing is, even though I think, I think it makes us look like a smaller company. Uh, my goal is the minimal amount of time from your order to on a truck. So I'm always afraid like a brand new customer will place an order at like, you know, two 30 in the afternoon and it will be on a truck 22 minutes later. And they're going, do they have nothing better to do? They're just sitting there and I'm your only order today and they're getting it out. Where really, you know, we've got a semi truck that comes to pick up the orders every day from the warehouse and it's, we overstaff so that we can get those out because sometimes it's medicine. Sometimes it's a heater. Sometimes it's your birthday. Sometimes it's, there's basically no reason to slow the, the process down when we can help it. And we realize that people put value in getting things sooner. So we will do everything we can in our power to get that out of the door as fast as possible. And then it's on the, the partners we have to use like USPS. We've done lots of trials with FedEx and UPS and FedEx and been through a lot of that stuff. And uh, they're all for one strength. There's a weakness. There's no clear winner. Well, actually, that's not true. In our opinion, the clear winner is USPS uh, due to price points and reliability. And and you guys have probably heard me before, but we, we track the analytics and I do like to check in on the analytics to make sure nothing's running awry. And uh, yeah, here we go. Order tracking. I can see some real-time metrics for you guys. And so let's see here. The last 30 days. <laughs> Where am I? Yeah, here we go. So in the last 30 days, we're in the, the summer a little bit. We've, we've uh, sent 8,285 packages. There's Right now, at this exact minute, there are 69 of them labeled out for delivery. You know, sometimes you've like looked at your email, it's out for delivery. And sometimes, yeah, it's 10 o'clock at night, you know it's not getting delivered. But a lot of times they're like, ooh, there's that, you know, there's that buzzer beater at 8 o'clock at night. There are 925 in transit. That means between us and basically your local post office. And uh, exceptions, zero. So that's good. Right now there's nothing in the system that shows that, like, undeliverable. We do get a few every every month. But they don't always get actually tracked in the system as undeliverable. You'd have to wait for it to show up. And then most time, they're getting back to us pretty pretty close. So uh, let me see. There should be metrics where it shows average delivery time. Uh, why am I not seeing that? Am I clicking on the wrong thing? Oh, I didn't click on reports. That's why. Let's see here. Map maybe? Uh, yeah, the average in the last 90 days. So here's the entire United States average for you guys. We've shipped 37,721 packages. Oh, no, no. Uh, 37,721 orders, which is 33,914 packages. Right? And, uh, so far, we've delivered 30,660. 944 are currently in transit. It just updated. That's kind of neat. It's showing me people that are ordering kind of like right now. But the average time to be delivered is three days. So on average, whether you're ordering a light, an air pump, a plant, everything, whether you live in Washington or Florida, the average is three days. From the time you order to the time you get it, which I would I would say in Florida, you're probably more at three, four, five days, somewhere in that range. In Washington, you're more at one to two days, depending on where. So that's a big old average. And sometimes places that are close don't get delivered that quickly because they're really rural. And so you might be like technically not that far away, but there's not that much mail going there. So it actually takes longer to get there. Kind of a weird thing. I got free shipping for one of my orders this Monday, and it seems to be shipping slower than normal. 
it would I thought it would have been there already. Yeah, it just depends on depends on planes, really. For the most part, planes and where the planes are going and post COVID things have just gotten a little bit harder on everything. Hmm. Oh, there's Tyler. We went at SFO after my China trip. Great to meet and talk shop. Any chance of a member party for the store opening? Potentially, yes. I shared some pictures, some updates on the store uh, expansion. We still have it in the the wheelhouse of like, yeah, what do we want to do? Um... But no, we haven't uh, we haven't officially set a date or the scope. And part of that would would if if we can do it, or when we do it, either one of those, would be when like last time we did a little event, we had to rent out uh, like the the martial arts studio because our stores alone won't be big enough to accommodate all the people that are gonna want to be there. So we have to go, hey, what would work here? When do you have openings? Oh, you've got that Saturday win? Great. We'll pay. We'd like to use that as overflow, basically. Because everyone will want to go see the new store or the, you know, the expansion. But then also, like, maybe Dean and I will talk or whatever that's going to be. So that there's not 200 people in the store at the same time. And it's like, yeah, you can go down, hang out for a while. And you come back up here. And then when you're ready to go, you go get your purchases and you leave. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's, it, I wish it was easy as like, just show up and it'll be fine. But you know, we, we have to prepare all the other tenants too of like, yep, parking is going to be a nightmare. Make sure no one else is trying to do like, you know, a, a weekly market or something and, you know, give a heads up to like the taco truck that's there now and, and, and those things. So that's a good point. Chad says, I live near Baltimore, so my co-op packages get a direct flight from Seattle to Baltimore. Yeah, definitely there's, you know, not everywhere is a direct flight from Seattle, basically where we are. So even though you might live in a real, uh, like real populated place, you wouldn't uh, necessarily get it quickly. Like I bet you, since Atlanta is like the biggest airport, I bet you if you live around there, I bet you get stuff quick. That's my guess. Um, yo, what's up, man? Just want to say I'm very satisfied with your products. All five of my tanks have my sponge filters, or your sponge. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. You're entrusting your fish with us. Um, yeah, the taco truck will probably appreciate all the new business. Yeah, we, we definitely try to coordinate. We don't want... To be disruptive to another business because you think that's rude. Well, we want to minimally impact them in a negative way. We want to give them a heads up because maybe you show up there and you're like, yeah, I went to the Korean Quad, but I also really wanted Venice pizza because they make good pizza. Or I really wanted the taco truck. Or I really wanted to visit this craft store. Or I wanted to visit this. Give them a chance to excel. And then also, yeah, just make sure we're not a detriment of like, oh, if you had told me, I would have had... 600 tacos ready instead of 60, right? Because I want to serve a normal clientele and then all of your clientele also. <coughs> yeah, we have a we have an active, it's a Honduran Mexican uh, taco truck with a seating area now in our parking lot. I actually haven't tried it yet, so I, that's shame on me. I just, when I'm there with Dean, we're working and I always forget to like, oh yeah, the taco truck. Uh, and by the time I think of it, a lot of times they're closed. So, uh, but yes, I would envision lots of us partaking in that taco truck. The employees, they eat it quite reg regularly. They say it's great. So I'm, I'm definitely on board to try it for sure. Can't somebody create a sponge filter that looks good? No, otherwise we'd be doing it. Zane, that's your claim to fame. Go, go, go make anything in the world that everyone will like. And, and then you'll realize it's impossible. So I like the green one because it doesn't show allergy. The next person likes a black one. The next person wants it to be clear because they want to clean it every day and it'll look good in their eyes. 
So I, I, I don't think there's anyone that can make one that looks good to everybody. Could you make one that looks good to your preferences? For sure you could. And search the internet. You'll probably find someone's done it. How expensive is it to ship to Australia on average? I think our average cost, well, it depends on the weight, but basically it started at like 30 bucks and up for like a pound, pound and a half. And so if you're already like five pounds, you're like, yeah, it's 80 bucks. Like, oof, not good. Does the light on our 50 watt heater ever turn green when it reaches the set or is it always red when operating properly? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's always going to be red. I mean, now I'm now I'm critically thinking because I'm like, wait, I'm live. I don't want to say the wrong thing. Like, but I believe red just means it's working. I don't think I don't think we can turn green. I think we can. We have a yellow light, a red light. See the the yellow light. I think originally, right when you plug it in, it lets you know that it starts the timer. Um, trying to look at my own diagram, I'm trying to find it. Click on the wrong thing. Lights and heaters. Yeah, right here. Yeah, it's just red and... Uh, so yeah, it'll be red when it's heating. And then the yellow light flash, you'll see right when you plug one in for the first time. And then you'll see it after two years of use. So uh, no, no green light to show that it is the temperature. The The goal, I guess, or the thought is that the temperature showing the temperature um, is what we want. Does that make sense? Uh, let's see here. Does the nano liquid fertilizer, okay, hold on. Does the nano liquid fertilizer different is it different, I'm guessing what you're saying, than the big bottle? Can you fill up the small bottle with the regular size? Yes. So they are the same concentrations. So you could take a big bottle and refill this dropper bottle. Yes, you could do that. Same concentrations. In the past, way long ago, we had two different formulations. And that was, you know, that was irritating for some people. And it was a lot of customer service stuff. So this time we made it. It's the same uh it is the same concentration different method so drops instead of pumping yeah we were before we had it both be pump heads but honestly it was worse for the environment and and that kind of stuff and so it just it, it was never a great seller in that form because it it i don't know it went it went faster a lot of people would buy it and then they get a bigger tank and they'd be like oh this cost me so much money it's like well you bought the wrong concentration I bought a couple Neo CO2 diffusers that you stock. Wow. I never had a diffuser that produced such micro bubbles. Can't believe that I waited so long to try them. Well, good. Yeah, like, you know, like I said, I try to sell the things I've had the most success with. I've used a lot of diffusers in my day and, you know, pretty much all of them will work. But I find that these ones are the most reliable for what I do. Um, that being said, I do think I want to develop a in tank co2 reactor but i'm just afraid we're gonna make something awesome and sell like 12 a month which that's a real low return on our time investment so will we ever sell the co2 cylinder kits the ones with the refill chemicals uh no we we've been approached by this and a bunch of manufacturers and well, one, none of the systems pass the Cori test. So if we were going to sell this, I want all of these changes. Um, and then two, depending on the systems they're using, some are using acids and other stuff. Some are trying to use yeast and sugar. They're different modes of shipping with different warning stickers. And this can't be mixed with that and all of that. And then I, I'm just, I, I still at the end, right? When I see the pricing, I go, yeah, but if someone's going to do CO2 for like over 18 months, they actually save money by buying the regulator and the real system so they get the better product. They'll save way more money over the course of like 10 years. 
And so I, I realize that it is you will save some money real initially, but long term, I I just don't think it's I I don't think most people that's the answer. That's what I feel like. And I'm worried that that uh shipping laws will change and stuff. And so it's like, oh, let's say, you know, we we I fear that problem at least. Let's say we sell 20,000 of these kits over the next few years and everyone's bought this system it's kind of expensive and they're buying the refill kits from us and then all of a sudden this acid we can no longer ship now you've got 20,000 people that are disappointed and they trusted us to buy a product and now we can't sell them the refill kits and so I don't necessarily like that uh, you know I, I still don't like that aspect of it so really there's too many cons for the perks I see and I go, well, my time's probably better spent. How can we make regulators cheaper or more education or, you know, there, there's something to making things cheaper and then there's something to making people realize the value they're getting. Like, yes, it's a more expensive thing. Like we all realize cars that we drive every day shouldn't cost a dollar fifty, right? Because Quality control won't be there. They probably won't be reliable and all that. So we know there's value. And I think right now we just, as a, a user base, we don't understand the value of a quality regulator. Um, and so it seems like it's a very big cost because we can run the whole tank off a $10 sponge filter. Why can't we do that with CO2? And it's like, well, it's problematic. That's why. Plus there's the whole, uh, like, customer service nightmare because different temperatures that you run it at causes different chemical reactions and things like that. And so, you know, people are going to have, even though they've got a valve on there that should be regulating it. Why did my kit run out at one month? And then three months later, it ran out in two months. And this one lasted three weeks. And this one did this. And this one did that. And uh, so we'll let somebody else. That's the thing is we don't have to do it all. There could be another company that can step in and go, we want to, we want to spend our time and we want to do a better job than Corey would ever do. Great. I say do that. When am I going to write a book? Uh, I am right now, actually. I'm kind of working on it. I got delayed or it's I've, I've been slacking. Maybe that's a better, you know, really. So Chris and Luca, Chris Luca and I are, are putting a book together and I've already started writing some of my parts and I started editing some of his for the English translations and my goal was when Katie and I had gone to Pennsylvania was to edit the whole thing and write majority of my parts. And what happened is like two days after we got there, her uncle had passed away and that derailed the rest of the time I was there. And then I had to fly home early and uh, watch the dogs while other family members flew there. And so from there, it's been a whirlwind of like, OK, and then it was China and then I got COVID and then like I don't even have a haircut. My hair is like out of control. Uh so I'm hoping that we can get things to kind of settle back down and then maybe, hey, sometime in July, all right, I need to spend two weeks and get my thoughts down, start refining them, do the editing, and hopefully by the end of the year or something like that, hey, look, this book's coming out and we think it's super cool. Somewhere I sh I've been showing, I don't know if it was Facebook group or or a community page or something, I showed like a picture of, of the front of it. So, you know, we've got the cover designed and all that kind of stuff. Which the book right now stands at I think at 189 pages, which it's it's pretty lengthy. It ain't it, it's not like a book that's like this big. It's it's gonna be quite a quite a book. And there's still work to do because we need to find a publisher that will publish to mostly the color and paper standards of Chris. Very picky. He's published a lot of books, and he knows exactly who he wants to work with in Europe but we don't know who we want to work with in America because if we ship it from Europe to America, we're just adding costs for you guys. If we can print in America, it will save you guys money. And so we'd rather do that. Mm. Do I have any recommendations for a 20 long Hillstream tank, particularly something more obscure? I've done Danios, mountain minnows and Hillstream loaches in the past. So I'm guessing you want something that fits a 20 long and maybe cooler water. Most people, you know, because the fish you've listed are cooler water fish. Let me look at that again. 
Hillstream tank. So I'm guessing it's going to have a Hillstream still. I'll work with that. What would I do with a little micro tank like that? I mean, 20 long to me is kind of the micro tank. I'm like, yep, it's going to be swished down, long. What would I do? What would I do? What would be really neat to me in that? Um, I th well, they, they want warmer water. I'm trying to think of something that uh, I think is interesting to me and also um, cool water in a 20 long. I'd probably add a grip of uh, silver hillstream, not hillstream, silver coolie loaches, because I think those are kind of cool. And then maybe, maybe if I was really trying to turn it up on its head and really change something where I'm like, oh, I need to do something different. I would uh, actually do blind cave tetras. It's a very zombie-like fish that are I, I find fascinating for a while. You know, a year or two you keep them and you're like, wow, they're just super interesting and learning about where they come from and all of that. So maybe that would spark your interest. I would do something like that. And I think the I think the uh, the hillstream loaches would be fine with them as well. The rosette on my new cryptocorn is huge. Does that mean it'll grow uh, leaves a little faster? Usually it means, well, the difference there is how fast the roots adapt to take up nutrients. That's really, bigger plants in general usually adapt a little faster, but it doesn't, you could, you know, if you put it in sand, for instance, it takes longer than coarser gravel. Let's see. I was the one, wait, hold, brain not working. Corey, I was the one with the guppy not being active problem in the Facebook group. Okay. I used carbon with hang on back filter and that worked, but I still don't know what the problem was. Yeah. So we run into that all the time when you're trying to help people diagnose. And sometimes I run into that myself in my own aquariums. And the, the reality is every day our aquariums have about a thousand things that could uh, that could go wrong. But usually they don't. And so being that there's so many things that could go wrong, it's very hard to guess what it is, right? So imagine, here's, here's things that we routinely run into that we'll, we're never going to diagnose, right? So like before I did the meeting, before I got in the live stream, I worked out, right? Trainer worked out, take a shower. If I leave any soap on my body and then I go work in the aquarium, I could contaminate soap. Or, like I've got, uh, you know, just the stress from travel and all that. I've got like a little, like, I don't know if we even show it. like, what is it right here maybe? Skin's a little red, so I've been putting some lotion on it, right? Yeah, just a little lotion. But I don't instantly wash my hands. So then if I'm working in a tank, I've now introduced a little bit of lotion. And those little bits of like micro contaminations that can go on are enough to be like, the fish aren't doing terrible. They're just not being normal. And so that's why I typically do automated water changes. But then when you don't know what's wrong, run some carbon, do some things like, you know, assume that you don't know what you don't know and go, I don't need to know what's in here. I just need to make sure whatever the problem is leaves. And, uh, yeah, and, and then I move on of like, well, it's probably something I did. I won't know. And maybe it's, you know, you helped a family member. They were stranded on the side of the road and you lifted up the, you know, the hood on their car and you were looking around, you touched some things and you got like, well, right now it's all off. But like as of Monday, I had lots of super glue on my fingers. I was intentionally super gluing my fingers. I, I should probably document this sometime. My wife was asking me, what are you doing? Because she was in there with me. And I was super gluing my fingers and spreading it around so that I could make sure that the super glue was acting how I wanted it to for when people email our customer service because we're developing our own super glue. And when they email customer service, I want to be able to back up customer service and everything going, I literally glued myself and I know what it was like. Here's what you're probably experiencing. So it helps us get through these problems because as you're, I was gluing some Anubias to Seru stones 
and I was intentionally like trying to make sure I got on my finger and all of that. And then I would rub it around and make sure there was nothing uh, abnormal that I didn't like going on. And so that's part of my testing. But with that super glue, let's, you know, now I've got other layers you guys usually won't have. I do test products that aren't known to be aquarium safe yet. And so if this super glue chemical compound is not aquarium safe, I'm going to be the first to learn it. And uh, so sometimes there could be stuff on my hands that I think is safe that is actually not safe. And then we would learn, right? But I would much rather learn that then obviously go, oh, we sold a thousand things of super glue and we've killed a thousand aquariums. Like it's on me to do the testing. So uh, the takeaway is probably something got in there, carbon cleaned it out. You'll never probably figure out exactly what it was unless there's a pattern and just treat it as a one-time thing. I want to say how much I enjoyed the latest pre presentation about knife fish. I never knew that I needed these fish until last weekend. Yeah, Regina, if you haven't seen, watch the other presentation we have about electrical fish. A lot of night fish in that one and how they communicate as well. So member only talk, pretty good one. At least it's the nerd level that I nerded out on. Uh, let's see here. How's Dean doing? I think he's doing pretty good. We worked on the retail store expansion last Saturday. Um, we're set to work there again. What do I know about Dean? Mm, I think it's been pretty good. Like we filmed the other day. He's, uh, he's got a video coming out this week, Friday. Um, yeah, we're, we're just in a different mode. We're spending a lot of time, not so much. This is going to sound weird when you say it. I, it, it. I don't know how to say it without sounding weird, but we're not spending as much time being friends as we are being coworkers. So what it means like, like on Father's Day, he sent a picture he's eating bits and gravy. And then I went and got bits and gravy. So that's friend That's friend time, right? But then there's time where, you know, he would say, hey, look at this fish. I'm thinking about ordering. What do you think? And he did that. And that's that's kind of, that's a little bit of work, a little bit of friendship. He's going, hey, do you think they're viable? Do you think the store, they sell well in the store? If I bred them, I'm going to try and order them. Like, yep, I, I agree. And then there's time that's purely business where, we were talking about what's the order of operations. Do we want to drill the 1,500-gallon aquarium before we put the background in? Do we want to do 2-inch or 1-inch? I've never had a problem with the 1-inch one on the Murphy tank. And so it'll be super technical talk and not really hangout talk. It'll be, you know, just very like, hey, I was thinking about this. This could be a problem. You know, going through the extra, you know, inch and a, and a quarter thickness of the acrylic. Should we buy a new hole saw for the 2-inch or will one that we've done a bunch, like how sharp does it need to be? Will that even be an issue? Are we worried about it getting too hot because it's going to be an extended drill to get through an inch and a half or an inch and a quarter? So, you know, those aren't so much how you're doing as, as technical, us really turning the brain. And uh, yeah, so I guess, I guess the answer is he's doing well, but we haven't done nearly as much of stuff in my fish room. So I told him, I was like, hey, We've got that whole other, one, other 125 I want to set up, and there's this and there's that. But we haven't done as much hangout time and mostly like real concentrated working time. And those are just different modes that we're in. So hard to hard to go, hey, how's life going? Because we, we, we are not going out to eat or anything. It's like we go to work and we work all day and sometimes they're real long days. And we might grab some food and bring it in. Like Katie brought us some taco time. Uh, on Saturday and we're teaching also Brandon the store manager on how to do some of these things we're doing so that he can service them in case something went wrong and so it's a, a real a real focus time as opposed to hanging out hey what's going on what are you working on what do you want to talk about all that fun stuff if I ran chemical filtration all the time in a planet tank would that be fine I always hear people say don't but why not well, carbon will absorb fertilizer. So that's usually the main why not to run that. But you can run something like Purigen. You could run that all the time and it wouldn't take out the fertilizers. It would absorb most of the stuff, same stuff that uh, carbon would. So in general, though, I, I think the one of the other pushbacks is a lot of things plants will filter out over time. Not everything, as you've seen with, you know, your, your tank was planted, but... Uh, and so 
it can be a cost that people don't want. And another maintenance, if you have 20 aquariums, that's much different than one aquarium. So if you have one aquarium, great. Run Purigen all the time. It's fine. It's an easy insurance policy. Great. 20 aquariums, that becomes costly. That becomes time intensive. And maybe you don't. What's my opinion on Japanese trapdoor snails? I think they're awesome. They give birth to ba they're basically a live bearing snail. I like them. Why'd my Hillstream loach disappear after a few weeks after adding them to my guppy tank? That's, uh, you know, you're gonna have to do a, a murder she wrote on that one and figure it out. Could be came in sick. Could be didn't like your water parameters. Could be it was super old already. Could be it's still in there. You just haven't found it. Um, but you got to play the guessing game and try to work through which, uh, you know, which which thing could have gone on, what's most likely to have happened. Do I have any tips and suggestions for keeping Corydoras? Yes. In my opinion, feed them lots of frozen bloodworms. They really, well, frozen bloodworms, frozen brine shrimp, and cyclops. I really, I really find Corydoras do best on frozen foods. They'll eat lots of dry foods, but trying to get them to breed and, and do all that, I really like frozen foods myself. I know exactly what you're saying. I've worked with good friends in the past. Then our friends' talks always turn to work talk. Got to find the balance. Yeah, there's... Yeah. And I, I, I prefer, you know, if, if if you get your choice, I prefer working friends as opposed to, like, strictly work because I like to, to know, how. hey, how's the family doing? Hey, how's that thing you were talking about going? Hey, how's your beach house going? Hey, what about this? What about that? You know, instead of like technical problem after technical problem, it exhausts you faster. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I, I I hope to hang out more. It's my goal. Am I busy right now? I'm only half busy. I've only got how many how many messages? Uh, let's see. Oh, there's only three active people waiting for a message back from me. Um, in the, the time I've been live, so yeah, we're about we're about par. How are the puppies doing? I took them for a walk last night. I think is that true? I think that's true. And they got their you know their new leashes and their new harnesses, and uh, wasn't too hot, so they pitter pattered around and enjoyed it. They what what were they? Oh, it was the fireworks. Wincy uh, is absolutely terrified of fireworks. We last couple of days have been playing King of the Hill at a little bit elevated of a volume to help, you know, get her. So she. So the problem is, you know, let's 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 get into the real puppy problem. Because of fireworks, it's always like a a month long thing around here. She now is going potty inside the house. She peed on the rug by the door. She peed on the rug in the bedroom, and so we're keeping the bedroom door closed. And it's because. She's scared of being outside because when people light off fireworks, it, it's just a trigger for her. And so, we, you know, most times she's hanging out with us. We got the TV on loud enough to, to mask those sounds most of the time. Um, but there's always this like two week area where she's just on edge and it's not good. And we have meds for her, but we usually only give that to her maybe the day before and the day of of Fourth of July. But uh yeah, it's rough on her. So Tinky, seemingly like no problem. Not at all. Like, eh, fireworks, who cares? But Wincy, you know, she got her name at the shelter. Wincy being scared of everything. And and uh, so, yeah, when we're walking her, a firework goes off. And, you know, we try everything we can to reassure her that you're safe. You're with mom and dad. Like, you've now been through 10 years of this. It's always been okay. We do what we can. We've tried Thunder shirts. We've tried, you know, some meds and all of that. And, and you know, we're still hopeful that she will get over the fear hopefully at some point but you know we don't really punish her because we understand why it's she's scared she doesn't want to go outside and use the doggy door to go potty we do have um little pee pads by the doggy door but sometimes she gets scared and runs like oh, i'm gonna go hide so yeah do i know of pet life radio i don't I don't think so. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. No, I don't know of it. 
Yeah, the number one pet radio network featuring over 70 pet-related podcasts, dog podcasts, and cat podcasts. Hmm, no, I was not aware of that. Now I do. Hmm, Ramplo has got an idea. Suggestion I've heard, record the sound, slowly turn up the loud, or the sound of the fireworks while eating, playing, getting snacks over weeks and months. I could see that where it becomes a norm. So like obviously not while we're waiting for the 4th of July to hit, but you know, maybe at Christmas you start going, Hey, we play this every day for an hour during treat time at lunch. And then you've got it set to two for a few weeks. It's kind of like conditioning those guppies where we're turning, you know, we're turning the volume down every, every four months for temperature. Maybe it's, I could see that possibly working. That's not a bad idea. I'll run it by Katie and see what she thinks. I know you don't keep African cichlids no more, but do I have any tips for Burchardi? I want to do a species-only tank in the 65-gallon. Yeah, little caves. They The females go into the smallest caves. and uh, So if you want to do it on the cheap, get yourself terracotta pots and just like drill or break small holes in different ones and they will choose it in my opinion the best uh, the best method that i've done sometimes is if you get the hole or the pot with the hole in the bottom what i do because I've, I've got wait i've got varying stages of my career right i've got from like been in the hobby 10 minutes to yes i've now owned a retail store for over 10 years but one of the easiest ways to modify a clay pot is to get a bucket of water, soak all your clay pots in it at least overnight. Then you can take one out. And what I do is I get like a pair of, of uh, um, brain work pliers. You know, so they've kind of got that, they've got this shape. And you put that at the hole. And because it's wet and the clay is softer, you can kind of just keep going like keep turning them and you'll watch the clay wear away and you can make, you know, standard hole to bigger hole to bigger hole. And the, the goal, what you're trying to do actually is you want a hole enough that is big enough, just big enough for the female to get in and out, but not big enough that the male can get in. Right. And so, or, or it can, so let me back. It's not that the male can't get in. You want the male to get in and fertilize the eggs, but you want the female to get back right at right at the top of that thing and prevent the male from ever coming back in or anybody else. So that way the eggs hatch, then you get a big group of fry, and they're pretty good parents and really enjoyable. So one of, it's actually one of my favorite fish to spawn purely from an enjoyment standpoint. I recently spearheaded the start of an aquatic club in my area doing a couple raffle prizes from the local swap meet. Any suggestions? Um, let, me, let me read that again. I recently spearheaded the club doing a couple raffle prizes from my local swap meet. Any suggestions? Like what to give away? I find foods. Foods are a great one that everyone can utilize. Um, and then, it, and then, what do the best at our auctions and stuff like that is foods and shrimp. Uh, so whether it's a mono shrimp or cherry shrimps, everyone can kind of go, Hey, I got a tank. I kind of put those in. Yeah. I could use some more of those. Uh, let's see here. Ick versus stress sick. My Amazon puffer seems to have white spots that increase and decrease. No other fish are affected. No health issues either. Without pictures, it's really hard to, to diagnose. I would say, um, you know, it could just be cysts. Sometimes a little bit of stress causes cysts in the fins and things. Those can heal up when water conditions get better. They can all get worse. I would try to start a log where you're noticing the spots and then document water changes and stuff and see if there's any correlation um, but without pictures, I, I'm just, I'm hesitant to be like, it's this cause that, that just seems rough. Um, but in general, the takeaways I always have improve water conditions, make fish happier, 
a lot of things tend to get better. And then if you notice it comes back, look at water conditions. Did it get worse? Hmm. I was reading Tory Brooks' comment says, as a long time, three decades of training mine, talking about his dogs and other people's dogs, I'm so happy to hear you don't punish. Taking the dogs on more walks and lots of treats can help. Yeah, I'm always, I'm always, uh, I don't know. I, I think from being young and watching some, some animals be disciplined and, you know, not like it was horrible or anything. I just, I myself haven't seen good results from disciplining an animal. And so I usually go, what is it that I'm doing wrong that's getting this undesired behavior or what can I do to mitigate this situation? And sure, sometimes you're never able to change stuff, but I think uh, in general, positive reinforcement has been more effective or, and I'm not even sure if it's more effective, but spending more time with your animal, usually you'll figure out stuff. Right, you watch those Amazon puffers more. You're gonna figure out more. You spend more time with your dogs. You're gonna figure out more. Right. A good example of this would be: so the past two days we've had these potty problems with Wincy, and my wife goes, you know, we think it's the fireworks, but I should probably just take a look and see. And, and like, what if he's got a, a urinary tract infection? Like, oh, that's a good point. That would explain the behavior too, possibly. We don't think so. We think it's that, but you know, I I, I think. I approach animals and then a lot of things is what, how, do, how are we getting here and what can we do to change that course? Not so much. Let's make it stop. The end goal is this behavior or this illness or this thing we don't like does come to an end, but maybe there's something we can change down the line that alleviates that. Yeah. Wincy is the sweetest soul. She was very, uh, you know, very difficult. And and she was, so we got Sassy first, and then we, we got Wincy as a, uh, a rescue, which all of our dogs, since Katie and I have been together, like we're coming up on 20 years, have always been rescues. Um, which means, and I'm not saying that you should only do rescues or anything about that. I'm just saying each dog that you rescue usually will come with a unique set of circumstances. Where if you were to get from a breeder or something, maybe you like, oh, I get to learn the history. What's the family history of this dog and this and that. Whereas when you adopt, you just kind of, you don't really know. And so we had found out that Wincy had never been on grass before. And she was used to going potty and then laying in it because she was kept in a kennel her whole life, basically. And so it took like over a year before it got to the point where she wouldn't go potty because we let our dog sleep in our bed with us. And you know, even at the year mark, it was still like once a month, like, oh, you went potty in the bed. So, and that's 3 a.m., strip the sheets off and all that. And here's what we got to do. And, you know, and I do remember there was a day where, uh, you know, my wife was basically breaking. And I, I was kind of already at the breaking point. I, I got to be honest, because it was, it was at a time where work was really stressful. You know, we were trying to still build the business and we we're struggling and then Katie was also working full time and it was, I was really questioning like, is this worth it? Is this more than we can do? And, but Katie wouldn't give up. And, you know, oddly enough, like a month later, there was never another accident like that again. And it's been great for like 10 years. So had we given up one month earlier, we wouldn't have this great dog we have today. And she persevered because Sassy, we adopted her. She was already 11 house trained, house broken, all of that. Pretty easy transition. It was Katie's first dog that she had you know, been the owner of. And so then this next one was the polar opposite. Probably the most difficult one, Wincy, has been that I've ever been involved with. And then Tinky, you know, more on the easy side, I would say. She just real protective of mom and dad. And so, um, yeah, that's... I don't know where I was going with that, but, you know, Katie definitely as dang near infinite patience. All right. Uh, 
<laughs> she brought me of 20 years, an amazing person. <laughs> it's true. I don't even deny that. I mean, if you if you really look at it, there is there is something to be said for yes, yeah, been with me for 20 years, but the magic of we made it through starting a business and the hard times together and we're now on the other side. Cuz there's definitely tense times both in business and at home and I I remember I still remember the most brutal part in my opinion was when my wife Katie was Dorkula was a bakery manager up in Bellingham and I have the retail store in Edmonds and we lived halfway between the two she would drive 45 minutes to an hour to go north and work there I would drive 45 minutes to go south and she was on a baker's schedule so a lot of times it'd be like I got to go in at 2 a.m and I you know I I get off at this time and then once she was manager it was like okay I got to be here to do this and the store was open noon till 8 p.m and then I had basically the hour home and so she'd be going to bed at 10 p.m to get you know, if she stayed up late, she'd go to bed at 10 p.m. to be up at 2 a.m. And here I am getting home at 9. We're not really sharing dinner together. We're at max spending an hour together. And it went on like that for like two years. So the fact that we made it through the other side, pretty crazy. Because the odds were not in our favor. And when things would go wrong, that only compounded things. You know, like the day when Corey just brings home Sassy, a Chihuahua, even though I didn't discuss it. And I was like, well... We're just keeping it for the night. Don't worry. If we don't like it, we're not to keep it. It's a rescue. And then, of course, he fell in love. So, you know. You know how it goes. Mm, my package just got to the post office. It's $5.50. Do you guys think they'll deliver today? I don't think so. I mean, there is a chance, but, you know, I if it was 9 a.m., I'd say, sure, why not? Snails! I have two tanks that have become infested with bladder snails. Are there any fixes? My pea puffers have very full bellies and the snails are still overwhelming. I would say try to reduce the amount of food available. Sometimes that means reducing how much you feed. Sometimes it means you've got some leaves that are decaying, taking those out, right? If you Or maybe gravel vacuuming a little more. Something to reduce the available food. And you'll watch over the next three months that uh, that snail colony dwindle a little bit. And that's the way I like to, I like to, I guess, progress forward with, I don't, it's not that I want, I don't want any snails. I just don't want 4 billion. I want 400. Like 400 between my tanks, acceptable. 4 billion, got a problem. Right now in some of my tanks, I have a problem. And what I would say is it's the auto feeders doing it. So I could tune them down, but I actually think I just need a few more fish. So they're breeding up. Like I think the problem is going to peak out and solve itself given another six or eight months, but I could intervene and like turn the auto feeders down a little bit and remove some of the snails and, and get there faster. But I, I like to see the natural, boom bust cycles and things going on in my little ecosystems okie dokie i've got african peacock cichlids one of them and their belly seems a little big i only feed once a day do water changes every week and sometimes twice a week any suggestions on what i can do i would check their poop you want to see that one go into the bathroom feed things like frozen brine shrimp the 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 shells and stuff like that is actually a laxative and you you basically want to see that fish go potty if it goes potty you're probably good and it's just carrying a bit of excess weight if it's not going potty it might be constipated and then you need to take some action um, but that can be common sometimes different african cichlids can kind of be a glutton and eat too much sometimes it could be the wrong food sometimes you know but i i think trying to make sure like I, when I was running an African cichlid store, and when I keep African cichlids, I try to every other day, I like to feed them spirulina brine shrimp. That helps, in my opinion, keep them regular. And uh, that's one of the biggest, the biggest things I can do to keep African cichlids happy because they can be territorial and aggressive. And when you take someone who is not getting very much food or is getting bullied and you apply that extra stress to it, it's very easy for their digestion system to kind of get off track just like if you're super stressed 
your digestion system starts, you know, maybe you get upset stomach or maybe you're getting constipated or maybe you get the runs, whatever it's going to be like, it has an effect on you. And so I try to feed a food that's going to be easy to eat. Almost like I consider it almost like a comfort food. We know it's easy for them to eat. We know it's good for them. We know it goes through them. It does cost a bit more to feed frozen to African cichlids because they eat more. But I find I get more longevity and more predictable results for longer periods of time when I do that. <coughs> oh no, it's a plant order, so maybe I'll get lucky and they'll, the expected delivery is by 9 p.m. tomorrow. Yeah, I mean plants... I will say this about plants. Plants can go like 10 days on a box, kind of no problem. That being said, crazy heat, crazy cold, anything of those, like there can always be stuff goes wrong. But I know one time I ordered a plant and it was in a box for like three weeks, still was fine. It was an Anubius, right? So it depends on the plant, depends on how hot or cold, depends on a lot of things. But there are people that maybe don't know that yet and they get really worked up about the plants if they don't arrive in great condition and or they don't bounce back or whatever if you're unsatisfied we'll take care of you if uh you know most people are reasonable and they go oh yeah they, they were a little bit late i'll put them in the aquarium hey they're doing amazing i see new growth don't worry about it and uh you know if if it's your first time all, all i can say is i think so many people have had bad experiences with a lot of companies whether it's aquatics or not that they assume, and we, we run this all the time, and I feel for customer service so much here, that you start, we have to start on the back pedal. Because people will, this is wrong, here's why I'm so angry, and don't even think about taking advantage from me. It's like, okay, we need to reset expectations. We're here, we've heard your complaint, we really want to make this right. What would be good? You want it reshipped? Do you want your money back? What would you like? We would like to do that. And so often they'll actually come back and like, oh, wow, okay. This is completely reasonable, but they're used to, you know, random Facebook brands or whatever, taking advantage of the situation. And, um, you know, that we, we all already so often have to try to put people's mind at ease. So if there's something wrong with one of your orders, don't worry, we're going to make it right. Um, and our outcome is, are you happy? If you're not, let us know you're not happy at the end, the, the worst that can happen really is like, look, you've gotten your money back, you know, but we will have tried before. We'll reship it again. We'll reship it again. We'll reship it again. Like, okay, you're not happy. Here's your money back. We will do everything we can to help fix the problem. Uh, so yeah, if those plants are rough because they set an extra day at the post office, we'll make it right. But I would, I would bet you they'll be just fine, honestly. But that being said, if you feel they are not, let us know and we will make it right for you. I love how your first instinct is to let nature fix the problem. The reminder to slow down, enjoy is always good. Yeah, I, you know, there's a lot of things in the world. Time heals all that kind of stuff. Like time is a very influential thing in our lives that we have a hard time keeping track of and all of that. And so... You know, you can be super worried about something, and then by the time something actually happens, you're like, oh, time has passed, and it's no longer an issue. So, yeah, I still got a little bit of a cough from COVID. I, I've tested negative for over a week now and stuff, but, you know, there, there's still a little bit of, a little bit extra coughing while sleeping, and so, you know, I'm not, I'm not back to 100%. I feel like I've given a pretty good show today. I, I don't think I could have given a, a decent show last week. Um, you know, and all, you know, there's a little bit of cognitive function where like, oh, my brain's not pulling pliers like I wanted to off the top of my head. And that could be a little bit of, you know, lingering COVID or just not quite enough sleep or just working really hard lately. Um, but I definitely am, I'm, you know, it's going to sound weird because it's a weird analogy, but when it comes to presenting and making video and maybe designing products, I can tell when my brain and body is ready. Just like I feel like, uh, you know, I feel like an athlete knows when they're feeling good, they're going to have a good game or whatever it is. Like they're well rested, they're confident, all of that's there and they typically perform better. And I think the same thing exists, you know, my sport is the video and the live streams and all that. And the live streams are actually, in my opinion, 
fairly intensive because you got to be on the fly. You don't know what questions coming at you next. You don't know what you might say incorrectly. So you're giving out bad information. You might have to correct. You might get yourself in a situation you don't want to be in. There's all of these things and it's live. And the reason I do them and it's, I've done it for a long time now, like five years of live streaming, is I wanted uh, everyone that watches the channel to know this is my skill set with aquariums. It's not, let me go read Wikipedia and then film a video and give it to you. It's, these are the things that I've learned from trial and error or the things I've traveled the world about and learned about. And these are my opinions and how I do things. And I want it to be as natural and normal as possible like we would be in person. Um, but it's like having that in-person conversation except now 50,000 people watch it and if you did something wrong, it's amplified. And so the risks or the, the stakes are high, but the rewards are also high. And so I know enough to know like it's probably not best if I go live today. Like I'm just not feeling it. And so there'll be times I tap out, but... Most times, once I get back on a roll and I've got a good show lined up and I know what I want to talk about, it it's easy and it's super enjoyable, right? But every once in a while, I go down a path where I'm like, you know, I didn't really want to talk about that. Like, mm, we'll see if people take it the wrong way. And if they do, then I got to backpedal a little bit. Or sometimes I just, I explain something and I've totally explained it wrong where I'm going, you know, that doesn't make sense. There, I didn't convey my thought accurately, and now this looks weird. So, <laughs> I'm happy you're home and back live casting. This has been the most relaxed uh, you've been in three weeks. And I do realize I, I'm going to call it provide a service, right? I'm an escape for a lot of people, whether you're at work right now or whether you're on a plane. You know, like Tyler, I'd met, he listens to all the podcasts while he's flying around the world. Um, you know, so I realized that this does provide a thing, right? A thing of like, Hey, that's two hours. And when that thing goes away, you've now got a two hour void to fill. If you were part of this, you know, what's interesting is looking at the analytics, uh, not that many people watch, uh, the live streams, which I thought the number was higher. And what I mean by that is there's some of you that are only watching live streams, which I think is interesting. Uh, and then like, where was the stat? The stat is, I was looking at it today because they put out a whole new stat for me to see, and I'd never been able to see it before, so I looked at it. And the the stat is, how many of you are watching videos and live streams? How many of you are watching uh, live streams and shorts? And how many people are watching shorts and videos, right? And so it turns out that, uh, let's see right here. So people that watch videos and shorts, 50% of the people that watch only watch videos. They don't watch any shorts at all. 35% are watching shorts. 15% watch both. So then you go to videos and live stream, right? 90% of the people are only watching videos. 2%, so there is 2% of people out there, only watch live streams which that's a crazy thought. I had never considered that there could be people that only watch live streams and never any of the videos. That's weird. And there's 8% of people, so there's an only 8% watch the live stream and our videos. That's mind-blowing. I thought the number would be more, right? And then there's, of the people watching both shorts and live streams, uh, there's 3% of you that will watch live streams and shorts. That kind of makes sense. Two hour content, 30 second content, kind of the polar opposite. So that kind of makes sense to me. But, uh, yeah, so I just knew ways to go. Oh yeah, I thought, you know, and so it shows us that live streams aren't a good way to notify, you know, that we have new product. For instance, we have to still do the video, but the people that have seen it in the video and the live stream are like, we get it, Corey. You're selling easy green. You sell stuff. I get it. But the part of the crew, you guys get it. You're only at 8%. So you're in the mi minority that, uh, you know, is that super plugged in. Just Emma Rose right there. I'm in that 8%. That's right. Watching live streams and videos. So, you know, the fact that you even show up to one of our live streams already puts you in that top 8%. Look at that. 
the elite, that's right. There's a very fine few elites that watch the live streams and the videos. And it makes sense. There's a lot of people that, uh, you know, they might Google, how do I set up an aquarium? And then, boom, there's a video on how to set up an aquarium. And maybe, you know, maybe that's all they need us for. Is there a breakdown by countries? There is, uh, you know, I can see how many people are watching from each country, but I don't know that we have, you know, like how many people are watching live streams in Singapore, like Shrimp Sanctuary. So I don't know that yet. I, I'm i sure that bre those breakdowns will come down the road. Um, but for now, I haven't found out to get to that point where, you know, how are people consuming and by country? Because there definitely is regionality to it. You know, India shorts and stuff like that are much more popular and so maybe like most of my shorts are coming from there. I have no idea. Have we tried? Okay, so Regina, that's something I, I've been seeing on Facebook. Uh, my pups are just as spoiled in a good way. By the way, have you tried the farmer's dog prepared fresh food? No, we have not tried it. Katie, Katie herself will make the dogs basically fresh food every day. Maybe not every day, but you know, and I've seen that and I'm like, I wonder how good is that? And I never know. And then I also, I worry about, do I have time to product test this dog food for my dogs? I do worry about that. I worry about, am I going to miss something in, uh, in like my family life? So like the dogs and stuff, because I'm focused on testing a product over here. Cause I, I test everything in my life, whether it's like, Ooh, what about this thing? What's my review of this thing that holds cords? It's a big magnet, basically. You know, I, I don't, my brain, my brain has somehow been warped and trained that way of analyze everything. How is this thing that has no relevance on my business? But do I like it? Don't I like it? What would I do to make it better? So, yeah. All right. Well, it's been two hours, two hours and seven minutes of pure fun. Uh, I promised. Katie, we could go out to eat if she wanted tonight uh, and spend the night. We might, tonight could be a John Wick 4 night. We meant to go see it in the theater. That didn't happen. It's now been on like Amazon or whatever for like months and we haven't seen it. And as dog people, as people that have coins, that's where I got the coin idea from was John Wick. Uh, I feel like I'm obligated to watch 4. Whether it's good or bad, doesn't matter. I... I probably could not be more of a John Wick fanboy in that I don't really watch movies, but man, someone, someone, uh, going, I'm going to say going to war. It's not war, but like doing battle over a dog somehow, somehow that resonates with me, you know, got to, got to protect the doggies. So, uh, yeah, we might do that later tonight. We'll see what the night unfolds and, uh, either way, going to get some food in me spend some time with Katie and the pups and I'll see you next Wednesday. My, my goal is really to get back on track here. Let's get all these Wednesdays lined back up, get you, get you eight percenters, getting your fix and uh, get me back on the routine. Hopefully voice improves and cognitive function improves and we're back on it. So thanks for hanging out. Don't forget to compliment somebody this week. Hopefully you're keeping that up, even though I wasn't reminding you. And uh, we'll see you in about a week. Have a good day. Good night. Eat something good. Enjoy nature daily. And we'll see you around. If I can find the button. I didn't line that button up. So there's always this dead space because I forget every time. You'd think after like a billion of these I'd remember, but I don't.